This is the eLearn Podcast. If you're passionate about the future of learning, you're in the right place. The expert guests on this show provide insights into the latest strategies, practices, and technologies for creating killer online learning outcomes. My name is Ladek, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. The eLearn Podcast is sponsored by eLearn Magazine, your go-to resource for all things online learning. Click-by-click how-to articles, the latest in edtech, spotlight on successful outcomes, and trends in the marketplace. Subscribe today and never miss a post at elearnmagazine.com. And OpenLMS, a company leveraging open source software to deliver effective, customized, and engaging learning experiences for schools, universities, companies, and governments around the world since 2005. Learn more at openlms.net. Hi, everyone. My name is Ladek. My guest for today is Vince Hahn. Vince is the founder and CEO of Mobile Coach and is an industry thought leader for learning and learning technology with an emphasis on artificial intelligence and chatbot technology. Now, in this very human conversation, Vince and I talk about what does it mean to be a chatbot and mobile coach and what are the biggest challenges facing chatbots today? We then talk about how might we use chatbots as an effective learning tool and apply them to learning strategies in universities and companies. We then talk about what are the best practices to implement chatbots to avoid rejection from users and create authentic engagement and experiences. Then we ask, how can we infuse chatbots with emotional intelligence? Or is this even possible? We then ask Vince his opinions and recommendations about the best chatbot for a company to obtain major value and to be successful. Then, as I usually do, I ask Vince what his opinions are about what the future of chatbot technology is for the near term. And remember, we record this podcast live so that we can interact with you, our listeners, in real time. So if you'd like to join the fun every week on LinkedIn, on Facebook, or on YouTube, just come over to elearnmagazine.com and subscribe. Now, I give you Vince Hahn. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the eLearn Podcast. I'm Laddick, and I have my guest today here, Mr. Vince Hahn. How are you, Vince? I'm doing great. How are you, Laddick? I am wonderful. Thank you very much. For everybody who doesn't know, where do we find you sitting today? I am my ho- I am in my home office in Provo, Utah, looking at snow. And I'm actually looking at little robins jumping around trees, wondering what to do with all this snow. <laughs> yeah, I, well, you know, I ask myself... What do these birds do? I'm sure that there's an explained on Netflix that will tell me exactly, you know, what they do. But like, I, I see birds flying around, not, you know, not here, but in Colorado, sometimes when I go there and I'm just like, it's the winter time. There's no food. What, what do you do? Anyway, uh, great pros you taught. Very cool. Nice. And literally cool as well. Uh, Vince, you are the CEO of Mobile Coach, which I, you know, I'm excited to have this conversation about chatbots and chatbots and learning. But why don't you give us the background, you know, on yourself, 60 seconds of who is Vince and and what are we going to be listening to today? Yeah, thank you for having me first. Uh, Mm -hmm. So the 60 seconds on me, um, I was uh, a musician in college many years ago. Um, I was a trombone performance major uh, back in the 90s, early 90s. And no one really stopped to tell me that there's not a lot of jobs for trombonists. (laughs) I was a trumpet player. Many people told me. Yeah. Many people. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> maybe people tried to tell me, and I just refused to listen. Um, but um, when I graduated, I trans transitioned into tech. Back then, it was the dot com boom, and there was a lot going on. And I found that uh, working in technology was just as creative as being a musician. And mm-hmm. so, I've had a career, long career in uh, building technology companies, softwares. I I love being an entrepreneur. I did do a, a MBA at MIT just so people could take me a little bit more seriously. Like, are we going to back this trombone player or, you know, what's this guy doing? So I um, had some uh, good experiences there and I've been really passionate around um, working on technology around usability. You know, what, how, how do people make decisions on how to use software uh, has been a big passion of mine. Fantastic. And so how does that, how did that translate into you now becoming the CEO of mobile coach? Like where, what was the, you know, at what yeah. point did you decide to jump and say, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm focusing. This is what, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. So before I started mobile coach, I was recruited to come to Utah. I was living in the greater Washington DC area. And uh, there was a company here in Utah that was starting a behavior change company. They had some mm-hmm. wonderful science around behavior change and they wanted to 
use that science and build some technology around it to help people lose weight, walk more, sleep better, you know, anything that was behavioral um, driven. And that was really interesting to me. At that time, personally, I was obese and I was going through my own very difficult habit changing lifestyle type of transformation myself. And so I was really interested in this science because I was using it on myself. And I found that it was really, th the science can be great, but unless you can get people to, to, human beings are really good at tricking themselves into making all sorts of decisions, good and bad. Mm -hmm. And I found that the, even though the science was really great, our habits and, and to break into the human psychology is so hard. Mm -hmm. and what's that statistic that something like um, seventy percent of people who have open heart surgery because of clogged arteries, just a couple years after their surgery, are back to their old habits? You know, it's like sure. on one mm -hmm. hand mind blowing, but on the other hand, yeah, I can see that. I could see that happening to me actually. Sure. And absolutely. so that is a long way to say that that was a really fascinating project I was part of, and then it it fueled the fire for me even more to say, well, how do we break in? To getting people to pay attention to healthy messages. Um, and that's how I started Mobile Coach because um, the thesis was what's something that people never ignore mm. by and large? And, mm. and the, to, to me, the answer was if I get a text message from a family member or a close friend, no matter what's going on, they're no, they know I'm going to pay attention to that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the thesis was well, could I develop a chatbot that had a personality s such where I could trust it enough where if I get a message from a friend or I get a message from this chatbot, I would give it equal or almost equal attention. And that's how um, my mobile coach started through that experiment. I can't wait to hear if that was successful. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I mean, we know notifications on our phones, right? I mean, if yeah, even though all of the dopamine, you know, science right now is saying, turn off all the notifications because you're, you know, you're getting nothing done. We know that that's still there. That That's exactly what it is, right? Um, hi, I'm jumping into the conversation real quick to ask you a very simple, quick favor. If you are enjoying what you're listening to right now, if it's if it's interesting, if it's entertaining, if you're pulling away value, if you're learning something, whatever the case may be, do me a favor and just hit subscribe on your podcast player right now. You know, it's if it's on your phone, if you're listening on a computer, whatever it is, just take two seconds right now, hit subscribe. It helps us. You'll never miss an episode and you know, everybody wins. And if you really like this content, you know, a lot, come on over to eLearn Magazine, throw your email address in there and subscribe there as well for other great content around our blog posts, around the events we play. And of course, this podcast as well. Thank you very much. And now back to the show. Um, but let's, let's address what I think might be the elephant in the room for, and it is for me, but I think for many people who will listen to this is, you know, we're recording this on the heels of the release of chat GPT, and, which is the, you know, now everyone's, you know, going and talking to this thing. First of all, is this a chat bot? And second of all, what does it mean for what mobile coach does and those kinds of things? You know, like kind of let's, let's just throw that on the table and, and talk about that for a second. Yeah. I think the definition of a chat bot's pretty broad. I mean, I think the technical definition is a computer simulated conversation. So yes, even if you ask chat GPT one question, it gives a response to me, that's, you can chalk that up as a conversation, short conversation, but it's a conversation. So I would say absolutely chat GPT is a chat bot. Uh, uh, what does it mean for mobile coach? Well, I think, um, I, I think the implications of chat GPT uh, will be significant across technology at large. Mm -hmm. um, I think just the uh, ability to to step up the quality of an answer when you ask um, ask a computer a question is is you know it's we had Google that really wasn't AI but it was an algorithmic process to give me search results in a in a matter of links. Chat GPT is also algorithmic, but it's just mm -hmm. giving me more of a substantial answer. Um, you know, how that affects mobile coach, I think, is still uh, to be determined. I think that what chatbot, chat GPT can do is give you an answer, but it's not something actionable right. um, yet. Um, right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so there needs to be a whole, within the whole tech stack of AI, there's search and then there's content and there's context, but then there's actions. And so I think that 
eventually there's there's going to be a whole tech stack of information context but then stuff doing stuff and, and that's going to go into robotics too like physical robotics what's going to power a robot's decision to physically do things chat gpt might play a role in that other technologies might play a role in that and similarly if i ask chat gpt hey you know what um i'm trying to lose weight can you send me reminders through my text phone but not this phone i have other phones send it to this phone at these times of days over the week over the next three months it won't be able to do that. And mm -hmm. so there'll need to be some infrastructure of companies and services that can really do anything that a human being might request a technology to do. So take me to then learning, right? Because that's what we want to talk about is, is using chatbots effectively for learning. And that can be upskilling, reskilling, uh, other things. I'm, I'm assuming that's where you focus in mobile coach, like places where it's, we have a really tangible A to Z learning outcome that we want to get to. I, it, how are chatbots there? Like, get, make the case for you really should be thinking about this as an effective learning tool mm -hmm. in your in your, in your company, in your university, in your course, whatever it is. Yeah. So, you, you know, I think one of the greatest functions of learning, learning anything, is time. Um, so, you know. If, the more sophisticated the skill I'm trying to master or the complex, the more complex the knowledge set that I'm trying to gain. Um, you know, I wish, you know, those of you that have seen the matrix, they just plug something to their brain and all of a sudden they could do all this stuff, right? That's not reality. Can we uh, pause? Can we pause for just a second? Just say, you know, in the matrix, it's old enough that whatever that, that, that you know, the, the real guy, he had to like put a disc in the system. Yeah. To, to like zap it into you. I just love how like that, that was like, that's, it's that old. Oh my yeah, Lord. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, um, and so if in as much as you all agree that, that a big part of learning is driven by a function of time, whether that's one hour or a three hour workshop or six months of working on something, I think we can all agree on that. They, they're, it, it's super helpful to have some help along that journey. Mm. And, and mm -hmm. to me, I think there's, to oversimplify it, there's two modalities to help. It's, I need help right now. Where can I get it? So that's more of a passive resource waiting for me as the learner to, to go get some help. But there's also a huge function of an active learner, an active participant who's holding me accountable, maybe checking in on me when it's inconvenient. But that's a really important part of real effective learning. And I think a chatbot can be effective in both modalities. Being there, like if for some reason I'm stuck on something at 3 a.m., I'm not going to call someone at 3 a.m., but if there's a chatbot there available to answer my question, a chat GPT type like mm -hmm. type of technology, that's great. And if I had someone that I trusted to hold me accountable, be checking in on me from time to time, I think that combination is really important if we're really committed to helping people learn. Mm. So how do we take me through the process of, you know, moving this from what you and I, like, I, I think a lot of people have been to, you know, maybe a, a software as a service, some, some site that's providing a service where the bot comes up and is like, Hey, you know, how can I help you answer a question about the service or those kinds of things to, you know, is, is a chatbot something that is going to live in some kind of learning management system or, you know, I've already, maybe I've already signed up for a course or I'm a student like, where does it live in that ecosystem? And then, you know, what's the complexity difference between something that's kind of just customer service for thinking as, as opposed to helping me along my learning journey? Yeah. The, one of the benefits of a chatbot, it's, a supposed, it's supposed to be frictionless, both from, <laughs> both from a usability perspective, like I'm not having to wade through tons of menus. I can just chat. Mm -hmm. Also from an accessibility perspective. And so a lot of us, have experience with chatbots on a website. And that's kind of what you're describing. I go to a website, customer service chatbot pops open. But what happens when I close the tab and leave my computer? There's mm -hmm. no way for that chatbot to interact with me. And so part of our definition of a chatbot, again, a computer simulated conversation is that a chatbot should be able to extend beyond a website. So you can have a chatbot on WhatsApp or SMS or Microsoft Teams or Slack or WebEx or Zoom or Telegram. There's all these you know, WeChat, there's so many messaging apps that are used around the world. And the way that's helpful for me to think about it is wherever people I know are messaging me, that could be Facebook, it could be TikTok, it could be Teams again. If 
if there's a chatbot on that channel, I call it a channel, that chatbot could have some usefulness for it. Mm -hmm. So um, the answer isn't simply, oh, just create a chatbot for this learner on your LMS. It should be, where are my learners? Where are they messaging people? And can I have a chatbot on that channel? Mm -hmm. and the answer is typically, yes, you can. And then the second part of your question, how difficult it is, well, you know, that depends on a customer service chatbot typically um, is pretty simple because if, if you remember as a consumer, when first chatbots first started emerging almost 10 years ago, people tried to make them smarter than they really were. And they were quite frustrating because um, you'd ask it a question and a lot of times it, it couldn't answer and then you'd be stuck and like, just give me, just please get me to a human being. Please, uh, uh, yes. One million percent. <laughs> that's yeah. And, and that's still true largely today. And so a lot of chatbots on customer service with a customer service um, uh, function have a big button that says live agent. So you can actually you know, circumvent the automation and get to a live agent. So that, that's actually pretty simple. Creating a chatbot, let's say on SMS, that's gonna check in on, on me as a learner over six months as I'm trying to master you know, an algorithm or learning how to do whatever, X, Y, or Z. You know, that's going to be a little bit more involved, but not as difficult as people might think. Uh, because, first of all, you don't want a chatbot to overwhelm people. You know, if I'm getting a message from a chatbot via SMS multiple times a day, I'm going to opt out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think the design sensibility limits the complexity of chatbots like that. Mm. Yeah, you know, again, certainly back to kind of the beginning of our conversation around chat GPT, but also, you know, what you just, you kind of, I don't want to say you stole my thunder there, but like, do people, are we just becoming more comfortable interacting with chatbots or do we, you know, how, how long, you know, what am I trying to ask? I'm trying to ask is what are the ways that I could implement a chatbot that assuage those frustrations, right? That that take that, especially if we're going to keep it in a learning context so that a learner feels like this is useful and valuable rather than frustrating. Like what are th some of the things that maybe best practices that you've seen around that? Yeah, I think, you know, we joked about the matrix and I think Hollywood has done both a service in capturing our imagination of what technology can do. And it's also done this a disservice by setting the wrong expectations. And so, <laughs> yeah, sure. you know, like I, I also think of... Um, you know, um, uh, Iron Man and Jarvis, you know, uh, Oh my Lord. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah sure. we're, we're, and, and even today, you know, most people have a Google home assistant or an Alexa sitting at home and it has, they have trained us to know how limited they are. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so they've trained us through being wrong. And I think, um, it, that's required patience as consumers to be frustrated at an Alexa. Um, but over time, we just learned, we either decide to turn it off entirely or we decide, well, I guess asking it what the weather's like today or asking it to play a song, that's useful enough for me, even though it might not be able to tell me the purpose of life in a meaningful way. <laughs> no, you know, and I found it, sorry to interrupt, but I found it fascinating as I've moved between, you know, friends' houses, you know, in different parts of the world, frankly, because I'm, I'm lucky enough to have had that life. But it's really interesting to see who's, taken the time to w interact with those and sort of say, Hey, look, here's the 10 functions that I always use. And I, they, they really know how to get it to work. Whereas other people like myself, I, you know, if it doesn't work the first time, I'm like, I, I can't be bothered. Like there's, I'm yeah. just too busy to train this thing. It's really that, you know, it's really interesting. Do you think within that question, do you think that those personalities still exist or are we just more and more becoming like, Hey, I, I'm going to have to learn to live with this thing. Well, I think in the, in the, function of learning, we have the advantage of a, a easily understandable context. Mm -hmm. So what you shouldn't do with a chatbot is tell people, hey, I'm Jarvis. I'm going to help you master this or X, Y, Z, or I'm going to fire off your iron suit, you know, whenever you want it. <laughs> um, so and people get that. So especially in corporate learning. So if you define the, the narrow scope of what the chatbot's going to do, like, hey, Laddick, you just finished this you know, high performance, you know, high potential leadership course, you know, good for you. It, we went over a lot of content over the last three days in this workshop. And my job as the chatbot over the next few months is just to remind you of the things that we learned. Sure. The principles or the, yeah, yeah the key mm -hmm. learnings. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I'm ever annoying, just turn me off. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I think within a narrow context like that, people are more than happy to interact with a chatbot. And then, and then it becomes the function of how good the design is. Does it, when I receive that interruption, when that, when that chatbot's interrupting me with a message, just like, you know, when my kids or friends interrupt me, I'm not expecting a message and they text me. When I look at it, by them being virtue of close friends or family of mine, that's all the context I need. Mm -hmm. With a chatbot, it's the message. Mm -hmm. So if the message says, oh, that's really valuable, then people we have found are more than happy to interact with the chatbot. If the chatbot's off or for some reason feels like, oh, that's, I don't really need this, then they'll either turn it out or they'll opt out. I, I love where you, the example that you just gave there, because I think myself for sure, and many people who are going to listen to this or are listening to this, um, they were, I, I think I came into this conversation thinking about how do I create a structure, like a tree within a learning system where I'm starting at, Hey, here's the introduction to, you know, knitting what I want. And then, you know, and then it's going to take me through a branched kind of tree according to how I, how well I interact with it is, I, I think that's still a legitimate use, but is that still just, is that sort of, you know, 2020 version and I should, we should really need to rethink how we're using these or is that not what you recommend to your clients? Well, I, I think both are, are, are great. Uh, you know, I think having a decision tree is a great best practice for a passive chatbot experience where the chatbot's waiting there for a learner to engage with it. And so like, I don't know if you've ever tried like a conversation simulator. That's very similar where, Hey, I want to practice how to have a difficult conversation. And this chatbot's loaded with like a hundred examples. So I'm mm. just going to go through a decision tree and practice. And, um, you know, that's a perfectly great use case for a chatbot. It, it depends what you're trying to accomplish. So I do think that it's useful to step back and say, what passive elements do I want for this chatbot? And if, if, if there are elements, then having a decision tree is a really easy user experience. And then, what active elements do I want for this chatbot, if any? Do I mm. want the chatbot to proactively ping people? And if so, what are those triggers? And, and by the way, could I have my chatbot smart and connected to my LMS so that the LMS can actually do a trigger? Like, hey, Vince, you just finished the Knitting 101 e-learning course. Would you like some help for me to help as you practice your knitting skills? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, I think there's some really interesting design, instructional design choices when you think about both active and passive, and it totally depends on who your audience is and what your learning initiative is. How close can we get to, because now I'm, I'm, I'm evolving in this conversation, how I think about what a chatbot is. Cause now I'm thinking of it like, Hey, there's this kind of digital person, right? Like there, there is a personality there that you obviously were performing. So how close could this get to be a, a coach, a mentor, you know, if I'm thinking of career path and you're saying prompting along the way, Maybe the maybe the right question is what are the limitations? Where would you, if a client were coming to you and saying, "Yeah, that's not maybe that's not a great use for a chatbot. You really need a human to do that." What have you bounced against that wall yet? Yeah, well, lots of people would love a chatbot to have some emotional intelligence because mm. emotional intelligence is expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know Oh man, you just stumbled into that. There was a phrase that a friend of mine said the other day, and I told him I'm going to trademark this. I'm taking it from you because it was like, it was like something. Like, oh boy, now I'm I'm dying with it. But it was it's literally that. It's like it's the emotional investment or something like. Eh, yeah. I lost it, but yes. Yeah, so yeah. emotional intelligence, tell, go there. Yeah, it, it's expensive, and so people would like that. But today, um, chatbots don't have emotional intelligence and when they try they're often wrong and when they are wrong people will it's a big turnoff we've all probably experienced that mm -hmm. now i will say chat gpt gives us a glimmer of hope of what it could be um, because i think the um the the even though chat gpt doesn't have true emotional intelligence it has it gives more substance where you can tell there's a little bit of personality in chat gpt actually which i i think is really interesting uh, but going back to your question, I think that's a firm line where people can say, well, we don't want a chatbot to cross there. But up to that line, a chatbot can be a coach in terms of following up with people, holding them accountable to their deliverables, keeping people on schedule, reminding them what their goals are. Um, and it, it, it can also be very smart, like sending me, it can, put in, it can put stuff on my calendar for me. It can be like a virtual assistant in many ways. Um, so I think we have seen 
clients who pull that off really nicely where there's a blend of automation. Um, Another way to think of it is if you think about like a human coach, a very skilled human coach, what are some things that human coach is doing 90, 95% of the time that are very repetitive and that can be automated? And if you automate those things and let that human coach excel with the five or 10% of things that where they're really in their sweet spot and they're really paying their bills because that's where they're needed, that helps an organization really not only save money, which the CFO is trying to do, um, but also really take advantage, full advantage of the of that that um, uh, skill set that really isn't very scalable. I love that, and now you know you're, you've you now teased us on you know everything from a really structured sort of you know decision tree kind of A to Z thing to you know essentially a personal assistant that, you know, you could, you know, pick up your phone and say, Hey, you know, schedule this for my, you know, schedule a meeting for me at 10 AM, blah, 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 next week. If I'm sitting in university X or, you know, mid-sized company Y right now, what's my investment on this in order to, you know, get something up and running, you know, that that's going to be, that, that I'm going to see value out of kind of tomorrow and feel like, wow, okay, this is, I, I want to keep, I want to keep going on this. Yeah. So um, I've been working on helping people with chatbots for nine and a half years. We started in 2013. I've been through thousands of chatbot projects, not only on the mobile coach platform, which is the platform we've built, but just helping because I'm, I'm just an advocate and an evangelist for chatbots in general. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the, my honest answer to your question this is it's time and attention. Mm. And, and, it's, and that's expensive for people. Sure. Um, I mean, times are most of that. I mean, that's the most yeah. valuable thing. That's what everybody yeah. judges their their worth off yeah. of that, right? Yeah, it's actually very ironic for people because they're looking to chatbots for scalability and to save cost. That's, you know, that's it's automation. That's what we want to do. But the common factor when I've seen chatbots fail, fall flat, or, or, and perhaps even most importantly, fail to accomplish the business goal that, that the, the chatbot build is trying to create is they, the lack of attention to the detail. There's a lot of details mm-hmm. that you have to wade through for the first six months, 12 months of a project um, to, to really have it delivered. Give me, give, me a, give me a specific example. Like, you don't have to name names of clients or anything, but like, what are some of those missed details that you've seen in the past uh, around setting something like this up? Yeah, uh, so uh, I'll just give you a very common scenario. So a company um, has a learning uh, initiative. Um, They want a chatbot to follow up with every participant for, let's say, three to six months. And they're very confident, and and rightly so, they're confident. And we know our people. Mm -hmm. We know the content. And so it's, and we don't want to overwhelm these people. So we're going to write two prompts a week over six months to send these people. Um, and then we're going to configure that. We're going to make it live. We're going to put it on Microsoft Teams because that's where we're on. And we're just going to, you know, see how it works. And so that's a very common scenario. What, ha- what happens sometimes, sometimes it's great, but a lot of times people will get the message and be like, eh, meh. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> I love that. There's nothing like delivery. You, you spend all this time you deliver and people yeah, are like, eh, whatever. Yeah, whatever. And so then they say, oh, chatbots don't work. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they should do is because there's a learning curve and, and sometimes the difference between meh and wow, that was really helpful is very subtle. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's the length of the message. It's sort of the tone of the message. It's the time of day. Um, it's, um, doing, and you, you, I, if I've been in software my whole career and so many people in software say, I wish we could AB test, but it's really expensive to AB test. Like, wouldn't it be great to create an app on a smartphone and have like three versions and see what which one works the best. It's really, no one does it because it's way too expensive. But with a chatbot, easy to do. Mm-hmm, you can mm-hmm. have half the people get a message at 2 p.m., half the people get a message at 10 a.m. and just compare the response. Um, and so that's an example of if you can commit to that level of detail and rigor, um, boy, you just your chances of having that chatbot accomplish the business result that you want are, are exponential. So going back to your question, how, how expensive it is, that's where the main expense is in my mind. Okay. But so the actual technology for chatbots really isn't that expensive. Oh, okay. 
So, so then tease this out for me a little bit because, and I'm probably leading the witness here. <laughs> You've worked in tech. I've worked in tech where tech people, you know, it, one of the classic things is, is that the tech people end up designing the thing that ultimately interacts with either clients or something. And so how important again in your consultancy over the last nine and a half years is, do you say, look, it's great that we've got you three in the room, but we actually also probably need the 10 other people who interact with customers or with team, the team, like talk, talk to me about that is need for that mix and that sauce of different personalities and whatnot to iterate and develop something that's going to be not only acceptable, but people are like, wow, kind of, this is really great. We want more of this. Yeah. You know, as tech people, we can geek out over like all these API connections and triggers and rules. And look, this message appeared right when it was supposed to. That's awesome. But the reader doesn't care about all those connections. They're just going to instantly react. You know, humans are so good at reading messages super fast. Mm -hmm. And um, and so they'll read it and they'll react. And so to me, uh, in my experience, I would say the number one skill uh, for a chatbot to be successful is writing. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. in that room, you need to have a great writer. Uh, so sometimes people in learning where we've been trained and I'm not, th this is just, this is a function of just reality. But a lot of times if I'm responsible for a learning program and the business says, okay, you can have my manager from the manager training, but you can only have them for two hours. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, okay, all right. So I'm going to write 15 hours of stuff and, and put it into two hours. Cause mm -hmm. we're, that's kind of life as a, uh, built as someone had, that's designing training has been. Um, and Sometimes that seeps into chatbot design. Mm. Uh, and so you need a writer that can also be patient <laughs> and can um, prioritize a relationship over the interaction. And what I mean by that is I would rather have the user not turn me off and say, okay, not opt out, but continue with the chatbot experience by me dripping, like really uh, it, you know, embracing a micro learning sensibility versus trying to overwhelm people and then turning them off. And so having a lot of patience and saying, I would rather have interactions last over months than, than a week if that means I'm going to get that person's attention and have them opt into our relationship um, over that period of time. How much of a sell do you need to make with the non-tech people? And I'm thinking at the, mostly this, I'm, I'm going to say this probably happens at a, at a university or the education sector the sphere right mm -hmm. but i can already i could i could really see a professor or even i guess you know somebody who is responsible for all of the you know the learning design for a company and be like hey you know i'm not a tech person i'm i i do you know i design learning i design how people are you know out learning outcomes chap it's, it's too technical for me this and that like what kind of sell do you have to do to get them on board yeah it's 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 work right now to mm. sell them Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's still, I would say we're still in the really early stages of chatbot design. Uh, in the, if I can use a baseball analogy, we're well, we're in, in the first inning. Wow. Uh, just yeah. the first inning. Wow. Okay. Just in the first inning. Yeah. Um, because I think, you know, the people building chatbots today tend to be more technical and I, I think we'll get into later innings when that university professor is comfortable. It's just as a standard practice to say, yeah, we're going to have a chatbot help my students in, in our class. Um, and, and, and the curriculum, so, cause right now, if that, and that happens from time to time, there's some really neat chatbot experiments happening in a university setting, but it's taking a traditional university content structure and trying to retrofit a chatbot into it. And when we get into the later innings, what's going to happen is the chatbot will just be a natural part of the overall learning design. And I think we're a ways away from that right now. Mm. I, I, you know, I'm remiss because I feel like I, I want to have like a six hour conversation with you as I do with so many of my guests. We're just like, you've, 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 you, I'm surprised you've redefined my thought around what a chatbot is, which is really fantastic. I'm glad that was the outcome for me, but what my, my final question for you is it's January, 2023 as we're having this conversation. What do you see in the next, you know, near future six, 12 months, you know, in terms of how things are changing. Is there anything that you're particularly excited about? Is there, you know, either a shift in the technology or maybe a shift in society that you think are, is going to be really prescient for, for the chatbot universe? Uh, I, it's, it's a really exciting time to mm -hmm. be part of chatbots, uh, mainly because, 
you know, when I first started, I had to explain what a chatbot was. There was a lot of evangelizing. <laughs> Today, people, most people have had experience with them and can, and then don't argue with that they need to exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but a, a lot of chatbot platforms, which are now sort of, even though the market's still very nascent and early, there's a lot of chatbot platforms that are quite mature in terms of they've been around for five, six, seven years. And those platforms have been made with the idea that if someone wants a chatbot, they'll just want one chatbot. You know, I want to build my own Alexa or I want to build my own single chatbot. That's sort of been the pervasive sort of common idea or thought. Where the market's going, going to evolve pretty quickly is that organizations, universities, even people will say, you know, I could see myself interacting with many chatbots. And uh, that's going to really drive innovation, make the authoring and managing of chatbots easier. The last thing I'll say about it, too, is that we're in an increasingly regulated world. Um, and, and we're seeing that tension in, in tech today with privacy and accessibility and this tension. And that's true with chatbots, too. Um, like, am I going to tell a chatbot my deep, darkest secret? And if so, where's that data living? And, and so I think answering all those questions is going to drive some great innovation to help uh, protect user privacy as well as really improve um, accessibility and usability for users. So I think there's a lot of really cool things happening. Super cool. Vince Han, you're the CEO of Mobile Coach. Is there any particular way that you'd like for people to reach out to you? Is it LinkedIn? Is there an email address? Like what, how would, what's the best way for people to contact you to get started? LinkedIn is the easiest. You can just find me at Vince Han and um, I check all my messages and I love connecting people with people there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Vince. I really appreciate your time today and I wish you all the best. Same. It was great. Thanks, Sladek. Thank you again for listening to the eLearn podcast. I just wanted to take one last moment here to ask you to, you know, if you enjoyed this episode, if you learned something, if you had fun, if you liked the guest, if you wanted to learn more, if you feel like sharing this with somebody, do me a favor, hit subscribe on your podcast player right now. Just do it right now before the episode ends. Hit subscribe and that way you'll never miss an episode as we publish them every week. Thanks.